Well, this rain has really made all my flowers and weeds go absolutely crazy. This is the little rose bush we picked up this spring. It's one of these easy care roses. They're so beautiful. been good for tomatoes. Our zucchini. Look at the size of these leaves. Huge. So nothing makes me happier than just a ball of fluff like this. I think I pulled in enough weeds for today. There'll always be more tomorrow, right? So, do you remember how to go round and round? You know how to go round and round? Hello friends, welcome to my channel Soulful Spinning. My name is Lisa and I can be found on Instagram and Ravelry as The Soulful Spinner. This is my channel about the fiber arts, mainly my love of wool and fiber, spinning, knitting, and sometimes weaving. I also share a little bit about the region where I live. I come to right outside of Chicago in the Midwest of the US and sometimes I take you outside and show you a little bit of my garden, a little bit of my girl peaches of course. I live with a 12 year old girl and my husband and son here in the Chicagoland area. So I hope you're well today. Today is the 9th of July 2021 and I welcome you to the channel. Uh, thank you so much for all your comments in the last video. I didn't respond to most of the comments because I'm doing a random number draw for the prize. The prize for my 5,000 subscriber giveaway. So I will insert that here. I, I will do the drawing and announce the winner here. And then I will uh, respond to your comment in YouTube for your mailing address. So I used YouTube Random Comment Picker and I found a winner for our giveaway. So Rebecca Hankins, her comment is, I love alpaca, got some once from my mother-in-law. The yarn is beautiful and the pouch is lovely as well. I will have to check her shop out. I bet a lovely light cowl might be easily made. Alpaca is very warm. So Rebecca, I'm gonna go ahead and respond to your comment in YouTube and go ahead and email me at soulfulspinning at gmail.com or find me on Instagram, I'm the Soulful Spinner, and send me a private message there. So I look forward to hearing from you, Rebecca, and thanks everybody for participating in the giveaway. So just as a reminder, uh, you'll be receiving this beautiful pouch made by the uh, uh, ladies in Peru. It's a woolen, it's all woolen felt with beautiful embroidery on the front. And then you'll also receive, excuse me for the crinkling, this uh, hank of hand dyed yarn. No, it's not hand dyed, it's hand spun. It's naturally colored. And this is hand spun. It's beautiful, beautiful lace weight yarn. So congratulations to the winner. And if you could please send me your mailing address, I will get this out to you this week. So yeah, I can't believe I've, I've surpassed 5,000 subscribers, which is pretty awesome. So in today's podcast, I'm going to talk about my uh, current knitting 
uh, whip, as well as an update on my Icelandic breed study. I've been working with Icelandic wool this summer and just experimenting and learning all about the fiber. And then finally, I have a couple of fleeces I wanted to show you today. Uh, one of them is one that I had in my treasure cave for a couple years now. It's a Cotswold fleece. I think it's just a part of a Cotswold because it's only a couple of pounds and Cotswold fleeces tend to be very, very large. So I want to share that with you. And then I also received some Gulf Coast Native by a lovely viewer, Emily, um, who I am Instagram friends with. And I wanted to show you that fleece as well. And then at the end, I thought I would share a few books that I've been reading, and, and uh, one in particular, I, I actually have, haven't gotten as much accomplished the, the last week because I've been obsessed with this book. So I'm really, I'm really excited to share that with you today. Let's go to knitting first with commercial yarn. I'm calling this my tomato shawl because the name of the color is tomato. <laughs> and uh, the last time I recorded, I, I had just finished the 40 rows of the lace chart, and now I'm decreasing every row and knitting the rest of the body of the shawl. So all I'm doing is I'm doing garter across and then doing a purl. But I have messed up this purl row so many times. I have had to learn how to fix garter stitch because I've had to drop down and correct. So it's, it's kind of funny that I've made errors on the, the simpler part of the shawl. Uh, this is a pattern out of this book here which is called Warm Days by Jody Long, Knitting Fever Incorporated. And the name of the shawl is actually tourmaline, not tomato, but the color is tomato. And it's just this very uh, warm tomato red. So I've been knitting on this pretty much exclusively. And um, it's a 90% cotton and 10% cashmere. And it's got a beautiful uh, drape to it, uh, a really nice, uh, nice weight. So I'm digging this decreasing every row because, you know, usually with shawls, you, you end up with hundreds of stitches at the end, and it's a slog at the end. But now it's starting to go faster. Every row goes a little bit faster because it's one, uh, one stitch less. So last time I spoke with you, I had been drum carding some Icelandic lamb's fleeces. I have a cream color and a gray. So I had finished, I demonstrated how I was spinning this in the last episode. Uh, this is um, a hank of uh, Icelandic singles, it's cream color. I did notice that in some parts it was under twisted, so it came apart when I was taking it off the wheel. So I have this little mini, mini skein, though I, I was just spit slicing it as I went. So now I'm being a little more careful with um, the singles, making sure they have enough integrity to hold together, because I tend to under spin. And as a matter of fact, Rachel Smith of Wool and Spinning just talks about this in her last episode. She um, spin some Wensleydale and she's talking about you know having enough twist in the singles to maintain integrity. So um, what I'm doing with the other color, the gray, here's, here's one of my bats. This is about 70 grams. Uh, this one and another one that was a similar size, I'm spinning on some drop spindles. So um, right now I'm using these two Turkish spindles. This is this is one from A. Gary, and this is one from Ian Tate. 
And I filmed a little bit of me spinning on these two spindles and talk about the, um, the process. And I will insert that video here and then I'll be right back to talk more about Icelandic. I got this idea from one of the, my viewers. She said that she does her Icelandic lopi singles with a spindle. And I gave it a go. And I like it because I know that the single has integrity because it's able to hold the weight of the spindle. Plus I can better control the diameter. I'm getting a much more consistent yarn using a spindle. So I'm using this spindle by, um, her name is Allison Geary, I think. She was a protege of the famous maker Jenkins. And I uh, purchased two of her spindles. This one's uh, on a larger side. And I like it for a thick single because with a thick single you want to have a very low twist. So you don't want to have, you want to have a slow spinning spindle. So I find that a larger, heavier spindle is best for a thicker single. So if you want a really fine lace weight yarn, you want a very light spindle so you can spin it very thin and it spins very fast. So I'm using this one. And then I also went through my collection and I found this spindle. This is from one of my favorite makers, Ian Tate. I've talked about him a number of times. He's a maker in um, the UK. The name of his shop is IST Craft, and I'll link him below. This one is made out of bog oak, and bog oak is uh, oak that uh, was well found in the wet swamps, the uh, wet um, ancient bogs of Europe. So they, I guess they dig it out and then they dry it. So it's really cool. And this one's nice because he's got his little brass weights in the cross members which makes the spindle uh, have a little bit more momentum and spins a little bit longer. So I have some of uh, the Turkish ones I have of his have that and some of them don't. I really do like that quite a bit. So, so all I'm doing is I'm taking my drum carded bat of gray Icelandic and I'm stripping a piece off and I'm not pre-drafting too much because um, you want to have a lot of fiber in each draft. So I find sometimes when I pre-draft too much, I draft more than I want. So a, a draft is just, if you're not a spinner, to draft means just to pull apart the fibers, to attenuate the fibers during the spinning process. Or sometimes they call pre-drafting where you sort of slightly attenuate before you start spinning. So here's my spindle. I've got it started already. And here's, I leave a fuzzy end here. And then I just lay my new fiber supply on the fuzzy end. Give it a twirl. I taught myself how to spin by flicking or rolling this. If it's a top whirl, I'll roll it along my thigh. But I learned by uh, flicking with my left hand and holding the fiber supply in my right hand. That is usually not the, the recommended way because it's easier to, to get the spindle in motion with your right hand because you're, you're using a, you're going clockwise. So they call that a Z twist, right? So it's easier to flip, flick that way. However, 
I'm so used to holding the fiber supply in my right hand that I'm just going to stick with my method. <laughs> There's no spinning pulley, so it doesn't matter. And then you can uh, create a really beautiful little turtle, but for this, I'm just what I'm doing is I'm just wrapping it around two, two of the bars, and then for the next uh, bit of fiber, I I skip over two. So I go over two under one, just like you you would do normally with a turtle. That's what they call this mass of fiber that is stored on the spindle shaft. So. I, I made a Turkish spindle video some years ago and if you have any questions about spinning on a Turkish spindle, why don't you go ahead and throw them in the comments below. Uh, I'm not a professional, I'm just an amateur in the positive sense of the word. So I give it a very light twist, I don't want a lot of twist in these singles. And I make a half hitch at the top. All right, so I can uh, you can just do a loop. And there's a little indentation here on the shaft, and that's where it it sort of stores it right at the top there. So I'll give it another little twirl. And then you draft. I'm drafting up quite a bit of fiber. I'm going deep into the fiber supply to get a, lar a large amount of fiber because that's going to give you a thicker single. Now somebody asked about this, what I'm doing here. This is a figure eight. So I've got the yarn and the unspun yarn right here. Put it over my middle finger and then I go over my thumb and I just do a figure eight to walk the singles up to the spindle and then I'm just going to wrap it around. So Beth Abbott in her book says that Lopi has about one twist per inch. I'm getting a little more than that, about two twists per inch. And the way I'm measuring that is I'm uh, folding the yarn onto itself like you, like a ply, it's called a plyback sample. And then I lay it along a ruler and I see how many bumps there are. So for this I am I'm getting better with the spindle. I, I'm more consistent with my uh, thickness of my singles. And I'm really happy with how this is going so far. So nothing makes me happier than just a ball of fluff like this. So this is a ball of that same fiber that I spun on my drop spindles here. Um, this was from pulled top off combs. And I have decided that combing, even with the single pitch Viking combs, is not going to be my preferred method for spinning the two coats, the tag and the fell together. Because what naturally happens when you pull the, the fiber off the combs is the longer um, fibers come off first. So you're getting all the tag and the longer fibers, and then you're getting the shorter fibers at the end. And I can actually see this in this yarn. Uh, some of the singles are very golden because those are the tog fibers, those are, that's the outer coat. And then the inner coat is the gray, the fell. So that was kind of an experiment. Um, I'm finding that when I spin Icelandic singles on a drop spindle, again, you want a heavier spindle that spins more slowly because you want less twist in your, in your yarn.
the last time I uh, talked with you, I had shared with you um, some ingle nook fiber bats that I, I have been finishing up. And I finished most of them. And what I'm doing is I'm doing a center pull ball to uh, ply. And I, I will insert a video here of, of how I do that. But Jillian Eve, who's got a wonderful channel, just had an episode about plying from a center pull ball. I'll link her ch that episode uh, below. Uh, it's very interesting about uh, basically you wind the yarn on a ball winder or a Nosta pin, and then you take the inside and the outside of the ball, and then you ply them together. It's very interesting. Um, it's not usually my go-to method. Uh, I usually do that method when I have leftovers on the bobbin, or in this case, I had these small quantities of yarn that I spun up on my uh, spindles, and I didn't want to go to the trouble of separating them into two and then plying them together. Some of these I shared last time. So this, if you watch the last episode, I had a crazy art bath that I made with some combing waste. And I got this yarn when I plied it together. And I love it. I would love to have enough. This would make a beautiful little children's jumper or hat. Maybe I'll make a baby hat out of that. It's super soft and cute. This is that Corgi Hill sample I showed you. It's merino silk and alpaca. And again, I just spun it all on one spindle and then plied it from the inside and the outside. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a book I've been reading uh, first. Then we'll talk a little bit about the fleeces if you're interested in fleeces. So my brother-in-law knows me so well. My brother-in-law um, lives locally, and he comes over almost every Saturday morning, and we sit out in the backyard if it's nice and have coffee and pastry. And he brought me this book. Uh, actually, it's from the library. And it's called Follow the Flock, How Sheep Shaped Human Civilization. It's by uh, Sally Colthard. I don't know how to, if that's the right pronunciation. Uh, she lives in Yorkshire where she keeps chickens as well as naturally sheep. So I'm going to read you the insert and uh, give you my thoughts on the book. From the plains of ancient Mesopotamia to the rolling hills of medieval England to the vast sheep farms of modern-day Australia, the domesticated ungulates of the genus Ovis, sheep, have been central to the human story. 
Starting with our Neolithic ancestors' first forays into sheep, sheep rearing nearly 10,000 years ago, these remarkable animals have fed us, clothed us, changed our diet and languages, helped us to win wars, decorate our homes, and finance the conquests of large swaths of the earth. Enormous fortunes in new society-changing industries have been made from the fleeces of sheep and cities shaped by shepherds' markets and meat trading. Sally Coltard weaves the rich and fascinating story of sheep in a vivid and colorful tapestry, thickly threaded with engaging anecdotes and remarkable ovine facts, whose multiple strands reflects the deep penetration of these woolly animals into every aspect of human society and culture. So I think I'm going to have to buy this book because it's totally up my alley. Um, she, she, it's a very well-researched book. She has notes and references in the back. So, you know, she'll mention something and then, you know, she'll, she'll reference where she got that information. Um, you know, from the early dom domestica domestication of sheep um, to, you know, knitting for victory during the wars. Um, it's just fascinating. It's got all these different anecdotes in it. Uh, and every, uh, in front of every chapter, there's these woodcut plates that are just utterly charming. I'm going to read you a couple of the table of contents here. Um, how to get a sheep to stand still. Woolly's scaly secrets. Why some sheep are so rude. Tough as old boots. Rhymes and ridiculous cures. Mr. and Mrs. Bo Peep. Dogs and drovers, scouring and spinning, knit for victory, sheep hath paid for it all, and so on. And it's a fascinating read. It's it's real. It's got a lot of anecdotes, and again, it's got these really charming pictures. Um, so if you're if you love wool and sheep, I uh, strongly encourage you to maybe pick it up at the library. It's got lots of different little anecdotal tales. Um, she also talks about like the oldest remnants of woven fabric. And she, she, there's this whole chapter where she talks about the bog people, about how people were uh, died thousands of years ago, but they were preserved in the bogs. The only thing that can make this book better is if she, she had uh, permission for the images. Because she'll talk about, you know, a Roman mosaic, you know, in some British town. And what I'll do is I just, with my iPad handy, I'll search it so I can actually see images of what she's talking about. So, you know, museum artifacts, Neolithic worlds, you know, that kind of thing. But it is really, really fascinating, and um, I, I'm thoroughly enjoying this book. Yeah, it's so fun. All right, so let's talk about fleece just a little bit, and then I'll uh, wrap it up here. I have some video that I recorded earlier of me uh, looking at the raw fleeces for this Cotswold and the Gulf Coast native, and I'll put that right here, and then I'll come right back and, and show you the wash locks and give you some of my thoughts on the, on the breed. I got a package in the mail yesterday. Uh, this is a sample of Gulf Coast Native by Alchemy Farms in Gerke, Alabama. It's a 2021 shearing and it's a sample. And a kind viewer and Instagram friend sent this to me. Her name's Emily Wallace. She has a weaving studio and she's a textile artist. And she thought I might be interested in uh, looking at some Gulf Coast Native. So this is the sample that she gave me. Um, it has been cold soaked. So it's been put in cold water to get most of the dirt, a lot of the dirt out. And so I can tell, I could tell right away that um, it was not scoured. So I have had uh, a fleece, a Gulf Coast native fleece before. Um, to my experience, they're very, um, they're very bouncy, um, very crimpy. 
Um, they do tend to have a lot of uh, veg matter in them. I think it's just the nature of the of the breed and where they're uh, where they're grown in hot climates here. Uh, they're resistant to all kind, they're resistant to all kinds of diseases and parasites that a lot of other sheep would um, be prone to here. So they are adapted from some of the sheep that were originally brought here um, by the Spanish and the French explorers, I think. So, um, yeah, it's, um, it's, <laughs> what's amazing me here is this crimp. This crimp is unbelievable. Um, this is, it's got a variable length. She gave me a nice, a nice sample. So I'm gonna pull out a couple of uh, se separate locks here so you can see them. So here's one of the locks. You can see it's got almost a wavy crimp. I would say this is about three inches. And then here are some of the shorter locks. Again, if you stretched them, they'd be two and a half to three inches. And then there's some super, super fine and crimpy little locks here. So without knowing what part of the animal uh, this came from, uh, it's got a variety of staples. Uh, going through an old piece of a fleece that I purchased from a lady from uh, Facebook. This is some, uh, I'm sure it's not the whole fleece because this is a Cotswold. I brought out my book here, my fleece and fiber source book. So here's a Cotswold fleece. Now, I don't know if this um, the locks aren't very long. I, say, I, I would say the locks are a maximum of a four inches maybe. Here's uh, the longest lock I could find uh, from the fleece here. And then here's a washed one. It's uh, very pearlescent. Uh, that, that was the first word that, that came to mind as I uh, washed, as I saw the washed fleece and the um, sample that I'm spinning up. Finally I'm getting this fleece out to dry. So I showed you in the previous clip uh, this Cotswold fleece that I, or piece of a Cotswold fleece that I purchased oh, a few years ago. And it's been trying to dry inside, but um, finally it's a nice sunny day to dry it. I thought I would show you the gloriousness that is a long wool. So Cotswold's considered a long wool, but this one's on the shorter side. Um, I hope that the camera is picking up this stunning shine of this fleece. It's just so shiny and gorgeous. Look at this. Uh, yeah, it's really pretty. It makes me want to get another Cotswold fleece. a dog. So long wools are really interesting. They don't require coating and because of the low grease and the structure of the locks, you really don't have a lot of veg matter in them. So this was not coated, but look at how beautiful and clean it is. My neighbor's probably wondering what I'm doing out here. <laughs> Talking to my fleece. Yes, I can hardly see out here. It's just blindingly sunshiny. Oh yeah, let's get you a better glimpse of this here. So pretty. So pretty. Yeah, it reminds me of a border luster lamb's wool fleece that I uh, that I have in my stash. Beautiful silky shiny locks. Staple lengths about four inches. Pearless and shine, just absolutely stunning. I love the long wools for their luster. 
and the, the weight and the curls. So it kind of makes me want to learn how to needle felt. I think you could make little creatures and use these as, as the locks. I really need to learn that in my retirement. <laughs> so now for something completely different. This over here is my Gulf Coast native uh, of Instagram friend sent me a sample of, of a fleece that she has. This is a very interesting fleece. It uh, reminds me of a fine Shetland wool. I did make a couple of Rolex and um, spun just a little bit of it up, but it, it spins up pretty... Uh, it doesn't have the quite the elasticity that a super fine Shetland does when you uh, spin it, though you think it would. Uh, I've got to do a lot more experimentation with this one. I think this one is going to be drum carded. I don't know if you're catching it, but there's a lot, quite a lot of um, little micro veg, and there's also what I see as Kemp. Here, I should put it here and you could see it. You see that? Probably not. But it's like a, well, Kemp. That's where I think that's Kemp. It's not wool. It's uh, very sticky, and uh, you have it interspersed throughout the fleece. So um, it's a feral breed. And I think they're on the conservation list. So it's going to be really interesting to spin this up and see what kind of yarn it makes. Yeah. My favorite summer pastime is watching fleece dry. <laughs> I lead such an exciting life. <laughs> So this, getting tangled up in my microphone, stick it in my pockets is. So this is the Cotswold. It's not a, uh, it, it's a coarser fleece, it's higher micron count for sure. Um, but typically a long wool is not going to be, it's not a fine wool, so it's, it's probably over 30 microns. 30 microns tends to be the benchmark for when people start to feel the prickle factor. I bought this a couple years ago. Like I said, I, I, I went crazy and bought a bunch of different breeds of sheep fleeces. But I found this and I washed it up. Doesn't that just beg to be needle felted into some sort of creature? So this is what I have so far. So I'm just spinning some up on my spindle. So Cotswold is considered a long wool. Some, some say it's called the uh, poor man's mohair. Uh, it does have some mohair qualities. Uh, but what strikes me about this fleece is its flyaway nature. Um, I made this comb nest and I used a, a diz that had too small of a hole and it's just like coming apart. And I think it has to do with the scales. So a long wool it, on the uh, su surface of the, of, the, of the wool, they're like roof shingles, so, so they're larger, and that also gives the luster for the wool. And also I think just makes them slip, slip away from each other easily. So here's a little nest I made. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with this, the finished yarn is, I've got a couple of samples here, I'll show you. Um, I think it would make a really nice weaving yarn, like maybe with for tapestries. So here's, here's a little thick single I made from it. And it's, it's pretty strong. So I think that if you dyed it, you could it would make a beautiful tapestry weaving yarn. Here's a two ply. Again, it's really strong, no elasticity. Um, not something that you'd want to wear next to your skin, but a beautiful sheen. And what I love about these long wools, I am also processing a Romney is that the combing waste, you know, the waste is what's left on the combs after you pull out your top, is mostly usable fiber. So here is, 
here was the waist that came off my combs. I mean, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful. It's not very little nips. And I'm thinking that would just be great, like needle felted. It's like a big snowball. Oh, it's so, it's so nice. I'm a wool sniffer. So that I actually made a couple of roll eggs with some of the waste. There. A roll egg is just like a sausage of fiber that you make with hand cards. They're, and uh, so yeah, I'm gonna experiment with like, this Cotswold. I don't have that much of it, a couple of pounds maybe. Um, but yeah, I got it in seven, uh, 718. And I'm putting a card with the breed and uh, if I can, where I bought it and when I bought it, because you'll forget, you know, you'll, you'll come across some fleece, it'll be washed, you'll be like, what, what the heck is this, right? So speaking of long wools, I also spun up an, a couple of bobbins of a Romney fleece. So here, I've got two bobbins, set this down here. This was a skein that I uh, spun up from, a, it's a Romney lambs fleece. I spun this up last year. It's uh, four ounces of a DK weight two ply. And of course I made the one skein and then I stopped, it just stopped. So I had to sort of reconstruct what I did. And so I did some experimentation. This is my control card. It doesn't have that much information on it. But all that it is, is it's just a couple of the singles wrapped around and then a two ply, ply back sample. And um, so what I'm doing is every, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, I'm pulling off the yarn and I'm cross-checking it against the card. When I first started spinning again this fiber, I knew I was spinning too thick. So I'm not sure how the skein is going to turn out, but but yeah, I thought I would share that with you again. This is a beautiful Romney fleece. I'll show you a couple of locks here. Here. Here's a couple of locks. This is a long wool also. This is a lamb's wool. This is definitely next to skin soft. It's about a five, almost a five inch staple. Beautiful. I did an episode last summer where I talked more about Romney. So I'll try to find the link for that and put it below if you're interested. Uh, but the other thing, again, the thing I want to mention is the waste, the combing waste. I guess I was reading that the worsted mills would take the waste and send it to the woolen mills and the, when they process wool in England, historically. So it's interesting. So here's the waste. Look at it. This is a big, uh, there's a few, like I try to get the worst of it out, like a little shortcut there. Put it in my pocket. I always have yarn, uh, wool in my pocket. <laughs> I wash my, uh, every time I wash my pants, I have these like little uh, felted wool balls that come out of the pocket because I'm always sticking, um, you know, just bits and bobs in my, in my linen pants in the summer. So the other one I'm going to start working on is this uh, Gulf Coast Native sample that was sent to me. Um, this is washed. It's pretty dirty. Uh, I'm probably going to pick it apart outside uh, before I do the combing. I'm not going to comb, I'm going to card, excuse me. Um, yeah, so let me show you a staple. So it almost looks like a Shetland. It's about two and a half inches. So... Um, Kind of an off-white color. It's it uh, it does have some uh, little tiny camp fibers in it, 
like half inch. Um, Kemp is not wool. Kemp is like a thicker uh, fiber that grows out of some sheep. Herdwick is a notorious example. Um, so I'm not, I don't really have, I haven't formulated any opinions on this yet because I haven't really uh, worked with it too much. Um, just started spinning on a spindle here. So when I first uh, got the fleece, I thought that it had been washed. So I took some and I combed some out and I, I spun a little sample. It's pretty somewhat elastic like Shetland. And then this is, uh, these are both Enid Ashcroft spindles. No, sorry. These are both Elizabeth Daly's uh, spindles. The Purple Heart one before was uh, uh, Elizabeth too, Elizabeth Daly, not Enid. So here is the washed. Uh, basically it had been cold soaked, so the lanolin, but really there's not much of a color differential between the scoured and the one that was just cold soaked. So, so Gulf Coast Native is, uh, they call it a feral breed. Uh, they adapted to the hot muggy climates of Florida and the south. They, um, they adapted from the Spanish, would, you know, the, when the Europeans came to the New World, you know, they brought their sheep. And so they adapted to, the, to these different regions. And they're supposed to be, they're small, the lambs are small. They're resistant to parasites and foot rot. Um, they've sort of adapted to that particular climate. And they are in a uh, endangered status. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in conser conserving um, sheep breeds. And so uh, after I process this, this is probably about eight ounces. I would consider getting another Gulf Coast native uh, fleece to work from. And uh, I, I will report back on, um, you know, my thoughts and, uh, on that process. Boy, I didn't think I had anything to talk about today. <laughs> um, so what else have I been working on? Um, well, last time I, I mentioned I wanted to show a few books I was using for my Icelandic breed study, and then I, I think I forgot to mention them. And one of my viewers... Uh, mentioned it, so I'll mention it now. My primary resource has been this book, and I, I mentioned this before. Um, look at these uh, woolen slippers here. Um, another book I have. This is this is excellent if you can get a hold of it. Um, she really talks about processing the fleece, the history of the breed, um, the tag and the fell, how to wash. Um, it's, it's, it, she gives a lot of historical samples. Um, it's, it's really an excellent, a uh, thorough, uh, research on the breed. I also found this book in my library. This is Icelandic hand knits from Elizabeth, no, Helen Magnusson. So she's a designer and who lives in Iceland. Uh, 25 heirloom techniques and projects. Uh, most of the projects in here are made with Letlopi, which is a lighter weight. Um, lopi, it's not all of, uh, the thicker Lopi. So here are all the different patterns. And most of them, again, are in a thinner weight. Uh, she has, uh, again, she has the history of the breed. She has uh, information about a textile museum in Blund, Blundos, which I don't know how to say that. Um, but I am inspired to make one of her, um, to make a shawl. She talks about the tag. Here, I should have found the picture. So these shawls are in the textile museum and they're made with the tag fiber. And she says, long shawls knitted with the tag, the coarser wool. Although tag would normally be reserved for rougher projects such as rugs and ropes, it makes a very crisp and elegant lace. Wearing a tag shawl is a unique experience. The shawls has weight 
and envelops the wearer, yet is as light as a feather. Got me kind of interested. So she's got a pattern in here. Here it is. Isn't it magical? Here, the light is shining there. It's beautiful. So this is the name of the shawl. So this is another book I picked up about knitting with Icelandic wool. Featuring environmentally friendly Icelandic wool. Quick Icelandic knits by Gunn Birgustotir. Dottir. This is really a cute book. It's basically got one pattern in it, um, but no, no, it has more than one pattern in it. But she gives you the, she, but basically what she gives you is the recipe for the Icelandic sweater. Then she's got also some variations on a theme. But what's cute about this here, so she, she talks about the basic construction. And again, just interchanging the, the yoke gives you you know, lots of different options, but um, <laughs> this, this is, it's got some really kind of funny <laughs> designs in here. It's really, really kind of funky and cute, a little bit dated, but it's but really cute. Let me show you another one that was really cracked me up. Like, look at here, these, <laughs> let's see here. <laughs> I don't know if your little girl wanna, it just, it's just really cute. And she's got some basic uh, patterns in here too, but yeah, like I don't know about the bobbles, but but what's nice about this book is she gives you good solid um, detailed information on how to steek and how to sew using a sewing machine, and so the technical aspects of it is really the reason I bought it. But you know, it might have been um, it's just really cute. Look at this, I'll look, look at that picture right there. Little girl with the lamb. Yeah. So, yeah, who knew Icelandic wool could be so fascinating. Really any breed, you could take a deep dive into any breed and just learn so much. to close today uh, by sharing um, a couple of other uh, books lately that I've been reading. Yeah, one of them is called Upstream by Mary Oliver. I picked this up at a local bookstore and it's a uh, selected essays by Mary Oliver. She's a famous poet who passed away sadly I probably two years ago now. I have this book of hers, Devotions. And I opened it up just randomly today, and I came across this poem, and I thought I would read it to you um, to close the episode. When the roses speak, I pay attention is the title. As long as we are able to be extravagant, we will be hugely and damply extravagant. Then we will drop foil by foil to the ground. This is our unalterable task, and we do it joyfully. And they went on. Listen, the heart shackles are not as you think. Death, illness, pain, unrequited hope, not loneliness, but lassitude, rue, vainglory, fear, anxiety, selfishness. Their fragrance all the while rising from their blind bodies, making me spin with joy. Sometimes you just open a book of poetry and one just absolutely speaks to you. And the other thing that, she, that I wanted to share is in her book of essays, she talks about creativity. 
and the call to creativity and also for her the the, the single-minded focus and the sacrifice to be creative but she she ended one of her uh, essays by saying that there is no other way work of artistic worth can be done and she talks about just you know being heedless of social obligations um, forgetting the shopping just working uninterrupted in the creative process and she says and the occasional success to the striver is worth everything the most regretful people on earth are those who felt the call to creative work who felt their own creative power restive and uprising and gave it neither power nor time of course she was a poet you know fine art a fine artist but that sentence really uh, resonated with me because you know that urge to create and sometimes we tamp that down with you know everyday life and you know again if you have creative power restive and uprising you should give it power and time and so for some of us it's just uh, sitting at a spinning wheel and making a skein of yarn and then, of course, for others, it's, uh, it's much, much more. So I hope that this episode uh, found you well, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, a little discombobulated today for some reason. Um, I'm so happy that you're able to spend time with me, and I always look forward to hearing from you in the comments. You can message me on Instagram. I'm the Soulful Spinner there. You can also email me at soulfulspinning at gmail.com or you can leave a comment down below. And I look forward to hearing from you. So take care, everybody, and be safe and have fun. See you soon. Bye-bye.